because in this life all we're actually longing for is validation and credibility yet when we're given it we reject it episode 149 Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Stephanie Sword Williams, self promotion expert and author and founder of the global movement Fuck Being Humble. Stephanie spent seven years working in advertising, becoming an expert in storytelling before writing the book and starting the movement, Fuck Being Humble, as a way to teach and encourage people to tell their own stories and change how the world views self-promotion. It originally started as a side hustle. Fuck Being Humble is now a global consultancy, online community, helping thousands of people around the world of communicating their worth, selling themselves, securing their careers and launching businesses. Following its success and impact, Fuck Being Humble has delivered talks to clients such as Google, Warner Music, Unilever, ASOS, The Guardian, the BBC, and many more. And she has attracted considerable media coverage. Stephanie was also named as Forbes 30 Under 30 Europe 2020 uh, Entrepreneurs and nominated by The Dots as one of the 100 women who are changing the creative industry. In this episode, Stephanie and I discuss how Fuck Being Humble began and what it aims to achieve, the cultural and environmental factors that cause us to shy away from self-promotion despite the pressure and desire for our work to be seen and some of the ways for us to recognize, demonstrate and celebrate ourselves and what we bring to the table. Now, this recording was done a little while ago, a few months back, um, but it's still incredibly relevant and a brilliant conversation. So sit back, relax and enjoy Stephanie Sword Williams. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Stephanie, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, you are a self-promotion expert and the author and founder of the Fuck Being Humble movement. Um, So I guess the first question is how, how and what is Fuck Being Humble and how did it begin? So Foot Being Humble is an online community event series and a book that is all about really trying to encourage people to be unapologetically proud of their achievements. Hmm. And the goal is really to encourage people um, to have self-compassion and also embrace self-advocacy. And these two things are really important because I think throughout our careers and throughout our lives, we're sort of told that if you work hard, you'll go far. And I'm sort of that person in the background going, well, what happens to all those people that work really hard and actually don't go far? Mm -hmm. And I think that talent very often slips through the net, gets overlooked, or for whatever reason, just doesn't get the spotlight they deserve. And I think a lot of the time it's because we wait solely on other people to identify us as you know experts or amazing leading talent when actually if you want to have that narrative you need to create that narrative so foot being humble to me is is a storytelling process that encourages people to show themselves off in the best possible way and i think it's really important for me to caveat i absolutely do believe that being humble is a really great quality to have it's always been something that I hopefully have had in my career um, and people see me as, as having. But what I don't believe in is when modesty overtakes opportunities that are right in front of you. So I think we've all been there before where there's somebody in the room that you're so impressed by or is a huge icon in your industry and you'd love to speak to them and tell them about a project you're doing, but you're petrified in case you sound stupid. Mm. So in that instance, I want you to think, foot being humble, I'm just going to go do this and tell them. Or if you want to put your hand up for something in a meeting and you're worried that, you know, maybe you feel a bit of imposter syndrome and people might call you out as not being good enough. 
Mm. Again, it's it's a mindset to adopt. I don't by any means expect people to stand on a meg- on a chair with a megaphone saying, "I'm absolutely amazing." I, th- I think it's it's about challenging a norm that has been heavily ingrained in our society and culture. Mm. I actually think is really detrimental to people's future. Where where do you think it comes from? There's a whole wealth of different places. I actually really interestingly um, have been through a bit of a reflective journey over mm. the past six months through lockdown. And, and one of the things that came out for me when I was speaking to someone about it was that in my life and career, there have been instances where I have felt overlooked mm. um, and not in a woe life as me, but just in at times where I felt maybe I was achieving and I either felt I deserved praised or felt that that achievement was worth celebrating. Sometimes the people in my life and the people that surrounded me didn't provide me with that support. Mm. And in fact, did the opposite and told me to, to be more modest or told me to not shout about things that I was proud of. So that interestingly from my personal journey, it's definitely come and that stems right down from when I was younger um, through to school days uh, right into the workplace various people I feel have affected me in that way so that's my personal sob story as to (laughs) why I think but I think in terms of in society and the things that affect us I mean as a woman you know despite us being in 2020 there are still huge issues with gender equality and the equal opportunities and the way that women are allowed to celebrate or expected to celebrate versus men so I think there's, you know, from a historical perspective, there's always been that men are the hunter-gatherers, men are a, go out and get get the, the food, get the work, get the lifestyle for their family, and meaning that that's more acceptable for men to present and promote in that way, whereas women were expected to stay home, stay quiet, and look after families. Mm. So I think from a gender perspective, that's always been an issue. And then I think you, you can't ignore the fact that for a lot of people and for a lot of religions and culture, it's, it is frowned upon. So I interviewed Nafisa mm. Bakar for my book. She talked about, I actually had her on one of my panels and she talked about as a Muslim woman, she was really shocked that I'd got in touch with her and said, I'd love to have you on my panel and felt being humble because modesty is something that she's really been encouraged to embrace and as part of her identity and that she should be grateful for everything she's had. And I was like, I absolutely believe in that and agree with that. Um, But it was a really good insight for me to see actually there's so many things that come into into play the way that our parents brought us up, you know, if they're from a different generation, my parents definitely the sorts of people who, um, you know, lifelong jobs, stay in one place forever you know all those you know if you climb the ladder if you work hard you'll, you'll go far sort of chat not really side hustlers don't really understand that side of the world mm. also quite academic so in marketing and advertising which is what I've worked in for my career it's you know given that you would promote and put your name out there whereas if you're an academic it's again frowned upon mm. and then I think you've also got things like education which sadly it, uh, I wrote a really good quote in a book from um, somebody that I think it was a philosopher who I can't remember his name off the top of my head, so apologies. But he talks about the fact that schools do a really good job of teaching you information, yes. but they don't actually equip you for the outside world. Mm. And, you know, I'm not at all slamming the education system. I think there are some brilliant things that are done and 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 again same for universities my course was absolutely incredible taught me a lot of skills but when it came to writing those personal statements preparing for jobs getting cvs ready portfolios ready that insider knowledge that they're not there to give you in fact somebody um, a lecturer actually said to me it's not my job to get you a job it's my Mm. job to get you a degree and i think that gap between finishing higher education and then going into the workplace, not having that guidance on mm. the soft skills and how to get pay rises, how to network, how to talk about yourself. Those key topics are what ends up stopping us from progressing in our careers for our entire life because yeah. we don't 
see the need or want to invest in it or as my book says on the front cover people just think self-promotion is a dirty word so they avoid it it like the plague it's so interesting and it's like so pertinently the way you you know the way that the title of the book is such a powerful statement and everything you've just described there um very much reflects like the architecture industry which is obviously like a part of the whole system itself and you know it's in architecture it's a very long period of time in academia and you're kind of ingrained in you that your work should speak for itself you know that's a very common dictum that saying <laughs> that, that I hate it so much i'm on a mission to abolish that saying it's the it. worst advice i've ever se- i've ever heard anyone give yes and I, I, i'm i'm sad that like you know i'm 28 now and I'm, I'm upset that I only sort of in the past couple of years I've realised it. I wish I'd have realised it sooner because, yeah, design critics or, you know, a lot of my lecturers were from advertising or creative backgrounds. And, mm. and it was always this, your work will speak for yourself. Don't over explain it. And it's like, but when you don't explain your process, you're missing out on an opportunity to, to connect with someone. Yeah. So what is the logic behind what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and particularly when you're at university or you're, you've got a portfolio, your work is quite complex and complicated and it needs explanation, it needs context. And the, as you say, and the soft skills around that of being able to communicate and actually getting the conversation with the right person in the first place. These are all, these are all, you know, very, very powerful life skills that can completely alter the direction of your career. It really does. And I think when <clears throat> I had this debate a lot because my boyfriend is a product designer and right. obviously we're like cheese and chalk um, when we have these discussions because he is an incredible visualizer and his, his visuals do speak a thousand words and they are excellent. But I'm always saying, just talk about the process. Talk about mm. where you source those materials. Talk about the fact that it's the first ever sustainable product in this category used and produced in this way talk about those things because you know when nike or mcdonald's or anybody drops a new product they don't just say here you go there's always a story there's always an advert we are constantly advertised by brands every single day it's how they sell products Mm -hmm. so it absolutely baffles me and pains me to see that people don't see the similar importance of doing it when you're an individual and i think that's what when i think about the the difference between foot being humble and lots of other coaching or professional development platforms is that I use my expertise from seven years of telling stories for brands Mm. and apply it to helping people tell their individual stories because I know the techniques, I know the tactics, I know that there is such a considered approach that goes into selling any product out there and very rarely do things just get picked up. And we have to communicate that narrative because when we don't, we end up making people feel like they're worthless or feeling like they've not done enough because they've not yet been spotted. And that's a really debilitating process for a lot of people who, like we see on social media, the comparison theory and the issues that we see with people constantly comparing themselves inflicting mental health issues on themselves because they're worried why haven't they got that promotion yet why haven't they got that uh, that salary yet why haven't they been featured in the press yet and this this pressure to feel like we have to get spotted is creating a really unhealthy culture within the creative industry and that varies across yeah right through to architecture to product design to Mm. advertising to music, to, you know, a huge ridge. And actually I think it spills into non-creative industries as well. Cause I have a lot of people, you know, originally my content was targeted to the creative industry. I think because it has obviously a different perspective, it also attracts people outside of, you know, I've given talks for brands like Unilever and, and Google and the British Red Cross. And if they can see the value in what I'm saying, then mm. there's obviously substance in, in the topic and the subject area that we have to change our mindsets around this. So, so what are some of the ways for people to, uh, you, you know, you put it very eloquently in your, in your book, like how to recognize and demonstrate what it is 
that you bring to the table? How could people start going through that process? So I feel one of the best ways for you to start really believing in yourself and reflecting in yourself. I talk about in the book, actually, there's two things. Well, there's three things. The first thing is you need to be documenting all your achievements, the small, the big, the medium, the is it even that big a deal? Yes, write it all down. So whether you've had a difficult phone call with a client and you've managed to talk them around and you think you've done a good job, write it down. Mm. If you've got a nice email from someone saying, well done on the work you did, write it down. If you've been on a podcast and you didn't completely fluff all your words and you did really well, write it down. Like make sure you're doc- and it doesn't have to be, you know, in this a huge statement. It doesn't have to be a long essay every time. I have like a Google document online where I save all the event feedback that I get. So when I run events, people often DM me or email me to say like, thank you so much. This has helped me in so many ways. And it's really easy for me to forget those. I get lots of emails and messages. So I copy and paste them into a G doc, but I also have an iPhone note section where I write down all my small and big wins. So I think in the very first instance, it's having a space that you can come back to regularly where you can document your achievements and reflect on them and embrace them. That's such a lovely idea. I mean, I know what it's like. Um, you know, I'm, I often like to collect testimonials. Yeah. And just sometimes I was reading them back the other day and I just felt so good reading yeah. them back. So that idea of yeah, documenting everything you know, and doing it, doing it for yourself is yeah, really powerful. And one thing that I've actually done, so I actually quit my job full-time um to go work full-time on foot being humble um in the start of march the beginning of lockdown Amazing. and i quit my job <laughs> to be a public speaker all public speaking events got cancelled so uh, naturally had a mini meltdown uh, but got over it quite quickly and, and turned everything digital and it's actually been going really well but one of the things that i definitely struggled with was i've, I've spent seven years working in businesses with lots of people around me and and I missed that bouncing off with someone and chatting and talking about ideas and struggles and problems. And because I love my work, I, I can fall into the territory of bringing my work home, which I want to avoid doing. Um, so I set up a freelance group with two other friends that are freelancers. It's a WhatsApp chat where we just talk about some of the struggles. We'll screenshot emails we've had and we'll be like, how would you reply to this? Any tips? And we just give each other a bit of, of help. And one of the things that I think we started doing was having weekly phone calls and we sort of ask each other how each other's weeks were. And then I, I felt like I was noticing that, you know, it was quite hard during lockdown to keep momentum and, and keep a positive perspective about the work you were doing. Sometimes it felt things were sluggish, but we were really good with egging each other on and being like, oh, well done for doing that. You probably haven't realized, but you've, you've just launched a new product in lockdown and 20 people bought it. That's amazing. And so I started this thing where I said, right, every week I want us to voice note something we've done this week that we're happy with. Mm. And I know it's a bit cheesy and it's a bit American, but actually, <clears throat> sorry to any Americans listening, but it's not <laughs> something Brits enjoy doing at all. And um, it's actually really clever in the sense that not only do you have to think of one achievement every Friday, mm-hmm. but you have to verbalize it. And by doing a voice note, you have to practice how you would present that information back to people. And actually, that is part of one of the most important parts to talking about your achievements is being comfortable with talking about it. So if you voice note it to your friends or your peers and your freelance group, then that's one step closer to getting comfortable with that achievement Mm. and actually the next time you're in an interview or the next time you're networking or you're in your performance review you can actually say oh yeah no I did do this and we what's really nice is we have a stream in our whatsapp group that means every Friday that we've got achievements that we can go back to and listen to if we need to reflect and remind ourselves on so I think that's so important and then just super quickly on the other two points was then I think it's really important for you to accept compliments from people. So I think for a lot of us, we really push away and reject when people say we've done a good job. 
we deflect it we we just don't embrace it we 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 do whatever we can to say oh it wasn't even me it wasn't that big a deal yeah. no worries I, I do that all the time it's please don't make a fuss about things and when we do that we don't allow ourselves the time to relish in our achievements mm. and accept that other people are celebrating us it's one thing if you don't want to do it yourself but let other people say to you what a good job you've done because in this life all we're actually longing for is validation and credibility yet when we're given it we reject it so the, yeah. the irony in it all is, is ridiculous and then i think the final thing that i think is really important is taking pride in that so once you've reflected and acknowledged it then you've accepted the praise that other people are giving you then it it's time to take pride in those achievements. Mm. And I think that's when it's really important for you to, you know, when you are at the pub and people say, how's your week go going? Tell them about something that you've done that you're really happy about. And don't feel like you have to go, oh, it's boring work chat. Because I think when you do that, you actually, you discredit something that you work on five <laughs> days a week. Like it's your life. It's it's you spend more time at work with your peers and you do your family and your colleague, your 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 partner, a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think you know people say I'll oh, leave work at work and I don't. I think you should celebrate it. And I've actually been really amazed at when I've talked about my achievements in social settings, the amount of networking things that have come off the back of it. People that have said, "Oh, I should get you into my company to run a talk," and I was like yeah amazing and that's like on a friday night at 10 o'clock at someone's house party like mm. you know there's it's such a i think the culture of not being proud of what you do is just is is quite toxic in a way because it almost punishes you for choosing something that you're you really enjoy yeah and not not being allowed to celebrate that and i, I just I, I really want people to learn how to take pride in in their achievements and not feel paralyzed with fear that people might reject them or or criticize them for doing so mm, absolutely and um, what's the role in emotional intelligence in all of this it's probably the biggest role and and, and, and what is it to you so emotional intelligence to me is understanding how to manage your own emotions and also manage the emotions of others when you are communicating. And that has become something that I've had to learn very quickly in my role when I worked in, in advertising mm. because I was the middleman. So I was the account director that would have to take a lot of crap from clients and then yeah. have to take a lot of crap internally. And I'd have to feed the messaging in between the both of those. And I had timelines to hit. I had to stay within budgets. I had to keep people happy. And to do that, you have to have a level of diplomacy. You have to be tactile. You have to understand how words might affect people's emotions and mm. how it could affect their performance. And be really strategic in the way that you create relationships with people but also how you maintain them with people and you ensure that they feel like they're part of a process and it's i'm i'm really fascinated by human behavior i'm, I'm a very observant person and which is part of the reason i, I came up with foot being humble was like, like observing the way that people did or didn't promote and i think with emotional intelligence it's it's going to be the difference between you sounding arrogant and you sounding confident. It's going to be the difference between you being irritating or being actually really educational around what you're sharing. Mm. And I get asked all the time. It's I, honestly, I'd be a millionaire if I had money for this question. So, how do I how do I self promote without sounding arrogant? And the way that is done it is with emotional intelligence and understanding the audiences that you're speaking to and what they care about. So people without emotional intelligence say and do what they want and don't really consider the feelings of others. People with it think about their audiences and how they can articulate opinions, work, thoughts in a way that will be responded to well. Mm -hmm. So I talk about, there are a couple of examples would be 
I talk about adopting different mindsets when you're um, being, when you're about to self-promote. So you could be the cheerleader where you, rather than making this announcement of sharing your work about you, in fact, you celebrate and cheerlead the people that were involved instead. So if I did a insight report and I interviewed 25 different people from the industry, rather than saying, I'm so proud of myself for writing a 20,000 word insight report, I am just so proud and impressed with what I'm capable of. You change that narrative, which I would never encourage you to necessarily say in that way anyway. But in fact, you say, I am so grateful for all the time that was given from the industry experts. I couldn't have created this report without you. It's packed with a huge amount of really useful and relatable advice. Mm. Thank you so much to X for saying this and to another person for saying this. It is so valuable hearing your opinions and allowing me to share them with other people. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're that you are simultaneously promoting yourself and your work, but actually the focus is on the people that inputted. So that's one t- tactic that I'd it's, say. It's very gracious and, and, yeah, and gratitude and, and, and creating, um, creating community. At the Absolutely. Same time. And also boosting your credibility because you're, mm. you're associating yourself with those people. So actually I would say the cheerleader technique is something that I, I use a lot and I think is really successful Another approach, a couple of, there's lots of different things I could talk about, but the underdog story is always something that I think people connect with. So rather than being like, I've, I've done so much, I knew I could do this, actually changing the narrative so it could say, I'll be honest, I was, I, you know, I was born in Leeds. I grew up in Leeds. I didn't have as any contacts when I moved to London. And actually through networking two to three times a week, hustling really hard. I've met some incredible people in my network. And here's a series of interviews that I've created or a series of podcasts that I've got to create, talking and spotlighting these amazing people. Um, I think I just want to say to anybody who's sitting on an idea and considering doing it, you know, I'm living proof that when you work hard, you're able to find um, uh, energy in you or motivation in you Mm -hmm. that can do this and you know what you don't need a private education you don't need to have funding or be backed by someone you can start your own ideas i hope my story can inspire you too and you know you can see like that doesn't feel arrogant that doesn't feel self-indulgent you're you're talking about the barriers you've overcome the challenges you may have faced the things that you've achieved potentially against all odds so with every it's self-promotion is storytelling And so it's up to you, the tone you want to have, the narrative you want to create and the language that you want to use. So if you don't want to sound arrogant, then don't use arrogant words. Don't, don't act arrogant. Talk, talk about it gracefully, celebrate other people, celebrate yourself. If you've done something great, I think another tip I always say is give away learnings from that experience. So I often say, you know, Here's three top ways I launched a community during lockdown that has turned into an international movement. You know, you, all of a sudden you've dropped in that you've launched a community that's now an international movement, but you're actually giving away three top tips on how other people can do it. So, you know, whenever you can provide education um, and guidance, that's all everybody wants right now, particularly as we've gone into a digital space where there's a lot of expectancy for free content, yeah. um, which is difficult for those that are still trying to make a salary like myself. Yeah. But at the same time, it's been the best way I've built relationships with people is that people say, you know, even when they do pay for my events, if I've charged 15 to 20 pounds, it's packed with so much information that they go away and feel so inspired. And I read a really great book, um, I can't remember, my mind is terrible. But I read a book about um, human behavior and how you can affect behavior. And one of the things that they said was, if you can allow people to achieve something with your brand or your community or your product or your service, mm. they will remain a fan for the rest of their life. So when I run workshops, I run them on how to talk about yourself, how to network, how to make money. And for example, somebody went to one of my money workshops 
And during the peak of COVID, she got a new job, she got a, a promotion and she got an 11K pay increase. And she messaged me to say that she attributes the success of that to the workshop, which obviously made my heart melt. Amazing. <laughs> uh, but what was, what's, what's great about that is because I enabled her with some of the skills, I absolutely don't want to take credit for it. I'm sure she did an incredible job in the room and, you know, it was, it's all down to her. All I do is, is help provide information. Yep. She will remain a fan of Foot Me Humble for a very long time because I helped her do something that positively affects her life. Mm. And I think that's the difference between where the future of what we're looking at with consumerism is people want to feel supported and not just sold shit they don't need. Actually, they want to feel like they're getting value. And I think if you can help people with that through your self-promotion, mm. that's a really good way to elevate yourself as, as a thought leader and as a, an educator and as someone that wants to support people for the long run, not just for the 30 seconds that you do a post. Mm. It, you, you mentioned here about the importance of your network and like of how, yeah. of how that's been one of the things that's, you know, um, enabled you to, to, to build your career and, um, and create you these opportunities. And yeah. in, in the design field, and I'm sure many other industries as well, like networking is, it, it depends. It's a personality thing often, right? People think, oh, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who enjoys networking. I hate it going into those big rooms and people are all sipping on, you know, cheap wine and, you know, yeah. sausages on cocktail sticks or that kind of stuff. Um, and networking becomes a, a sort of a, a sort of fear, if you like, or yeah. a kind of, or people do do it and they do it a lot, but it never really provides any produces any results or any relationships. What have been some of your, you know, how have you really capitalised on making networking, you know, a, a, the the engine of your career, if you like? So I think networking so for me when I first started I moved to London and I joined a startup it was a two-person company and I was their first employee yep. I took on a job of senior account manager new business development and a producer uh, I'm somebody that likes to get stuck in do loads of different things and I thought that networking was going to be a walk in the park I thought that getting new business was going to be easy I'm a very chatty person I'm very confident no problem and what I soon realized was it doesn't it's not about being confident it's not about being an extrovert an introvert mm. it's actually there's a lot of tactics that come with networking and it took me probably two years to understand what they were and to develop them and, and a big thing that I say to a lot of people is understanding listening is the key part asking as, as many questions as possible about that person let them talk everybody wants to talk about themselves everybody loves talking about themselves mm. so ask them loads of questions and when the time is right you then have all the information you need to propose your pitch back to them in the most effective way when we don't and we walk into situations and we just go straight in we end up potentially missing out on an opportunity because we've only pitched ourselves in one particular way and i think it's really important for people to give a broad perspective and and listen to what they really listen active listening not like yeah yeah i'm listening but i'm thinking about the next thing i'm going to say about myself it's listening and then going what question can i ask them to keep them talking and i think for me in terms of the importance of building the network like it's it's been invaluable and and as i said I moved to London with zero contacts. Yeah. I never had a, an uncle that worked at Vice magazine. I never knew somebody that worked at MTV or uh, Adam and Eve creative agency. I never had those contacts. Every work experience, every job I've got has always been from me hustling and for me putting myself in networking situations or, mm. or speaking to people and being open about my achievements and celebrating them. And I, Again, another saying I want to abolish is the it's not who you, it's not what you know it's who you know. Yeah. And I actually think it's not it's not who you know it's who you are. Mm. And the reason I say that is because that is me. I didn't know anyone, but who I am is as a person 
is I'm tenacious, I'm relentless, I'm somebody that won't stop until I, I find the connections that I want to connect with. And over the years I've learned, and it's something that I've been saying to a lot of people, is that there are so many reasons why things don't happen for you at that one point that you want it to do. But you can't take that personally. You can't feel like that is the that you are the sole reason. I watched a webinar recently and, and someone said on it, take no's as a not right now. And that's a really important message for when you're networking mm. is to have that persistent attitude of like, you're in the same way that you go on dates. You don't love every date you go on, but it doesn't stop you from dating. Yeah. You know, it's really important that networking doesn't have to be men in suits. And, and I know I've, I've been in those rooms. It, it can be, but networking can also be like, doing an IG live on Instagram or uh, just DMing someone on LinkedIn yes. or yes. <laughs> and digital networking is massive. So like I've been, I host, I've been hosting webinars every week since March and I, you know, I really encourage people when they join the webinar, put your Instagram or LinkedIn profile on, let the group know what you're looking to gain. Like, do you, are you looking for freelance work at the moment? Do you want to interview some people for your podcast? And in actually use the chat function and network with people. And I've seen people go on each other's podcasts or start projects together off the back of a webinar I was running. Like use those spaces that are being created uh, mm. for you to actually network. And, and uh, to your point, like in a way, the good thing about digital networking is you don't have to talk to people you don't like and you can get out of that very quickly. And you don't have to drink the crap wine and you don't have to waste an hour either side traveling to get there. You know, yeah. you can do it all from the comfort of your own home whilst watching whatever TV program you're enjoying. And, and, so, and, and you can go on Facebook and find out a little bit more about their personal life. And yeah, <laughs> social stalking in yeah. a non-weird way. That's what I encourage people to do. Always go check out their LinkedIn profiles, their Twitter profiles. I heard a great story yesterday about somebody, some there was a creative team that wanted to get an interview at an advertising agency. They went on the creative director's Twitter account. They saw that he loved radio, a radio channel, let's say smooth mm. radio. And I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> and they, they contacted smooth radio and said, will you do a shout out to this name and ask them, ask him if he will do a portfolio review and can we have an interview? And they recorded it and sent it to them and they got an interview the next oh, day. Oh, I love it. You know, when you're like, love and it. you know, that's a very creative idea. And I don't want to freak out anyone by saying that you have to do that because you don't. Mm. But it just made me think like, you know, that that is utilizing the fact that we are in digitally online now and you have a probably you've got more time to search and explore. And even when I used to go networking in person, which I used to do a lot, yeah. even like I'd have a really busy day and I'd be on the tube on the way to the, the event. If it was a really interesting panel, I'd go on the news, on Google News, I'd write in their name and I'd see what had come up. And if it said, has recently signed a book deal, or if it said, has just launched a new community, I would read up on that article and then go over to them at the session and be like oh hi um I, I just want to say i absolutely love that you've started that community it, it's so important and and build a conversation with that and i used to sometimes do it when i was in the room on the back row just quickly stalking them see what article they'd recently shared or liked or written so you know you really last minute but that preparation before you go to networking events really helps you because i think part of the reason people hate networking is the fear that they'll run out of things to say or mm. there'll be awkward silences or they'll mess up so actually the more you equip yourself with content and information before you go into that room you'll feel way more confident and robert Poynton wrote the book do improvise i talk about it a lot and in the book he says every conversation we have with people is an improvisation this podcast that we're talking about right now i have no idea what you're about to ask me yeah. I have no, I don't, I don't, we've not, we've not pre-discussed questions and yet I'm still able to answer. Yeah. If, if, if you went into a coffee shop and somebody asked you questions about things, you don't, you don't know what they're about to ask you, but you can always answer the same way that if your friend asked, you meet up with a, for a drink with them and they ask you questions, you don't know what they're going to ask you, but you can always reply. And I think that's a really good way to think about when you're in networking situation with strangers 
not knowing what's going to come next is what you experience every day with every conversation you have. So don't build up this anxiety in your head that you're going to be, you know, stumped with nothing to say. You know, you, you will always be able to say something. Sometimes it may not be your best polished answer, but <laughs> you, each time you, you start to practice your pitch and you'll get much better as you go along. And th- this is it as well. The, the recognizing that, you know, being good at improvising is a, is a skill and the fact that you're already good at it because you're able to have conversations with people normally. Yeah. Uh, and that's well, like, one of the key elements of, of, of networking. And as you say, having that preparation um, and some tools in your back pocket or some open questions that you can use, again, yeah. it's all part of, the, of getting to know people and make, make those deeper connections. Your, your inner voice is your biggest critic and the stories we make up in our heads. I mean, I'm sure everyone does it. Like you, you, you do something wrong at work and then you think about every worst possible situation that could happen. And you're like, mm. oh my God, my boss is going to see this. It's going to get sent publicly. Then I'm going to get fired. Then I'm never going to get a job again. Oh my God. And <laughs> we do this like every minute of the day about something different that we've done. And that is what builds up a lot of the anxiety and fear most of the time because a lot a lot of people say, I don't do networking when they've never been to a networking event. Mm. It, 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 honestly, it makes me laugh so much. And I, I, in the book, I do talk about there are so many different ways to network that don't just mean you're sat in a boring room talking to boring people. Yeah. So I, I would encourage people to get the book just to read that chapter alone. Brilliant. Um, in, in the book, actually, you've got an, a really inspiring group of uh entrepreneurs and thought leaders and business leaders that you've that you've interviewed um can you tell us a little bit about about those people and and why you chose them so you actually asked me at the start of the session how i started why i started and how i started for being humble. i didn't actually answer the how section yeah. and the how is really closely linked to this because all those women that i featured in the book inspired me when i first moved to london and they made me start Fuck Being Humble. Right. And I wanted to pay a tribute to them, basically, and say, you are the women that I wouldn't have done this without you. So when I started, when I first moved to London, because I was networking a lot, I was going to professional networking situations, but I would also really go to exhibitions, pop-ups, festivals, meet people and and it was actually at those less work related ones that i got most inspired by artists entrepreneurs creators Mm. and i was like meeting 23 year olds that had two side hustles on the go or a 28 year old that had started you know an international diversity business that was teaching google and some of the biggest brands and being flown out to south africa to deliver workshops and i was like wow you can do all of that before before you're 50 and one of the things that i found at the professional networking events was there was very often it was men over the age of 50 white middle class had running businesses over 100 people And it was always those people. And I was a 25 year old from the North of England, not privately educated, didn't have a huge amount of network, but I had lots of ideas. And it's very hard when you go to industry events because a lot of the time I feel like people just talk about about their career, but don't actually give you advice on how to pursue your own. Mm. Um, It's always about, oh, and, and in 1992, I did this. And then I moved to this and it's like, well, what am I gaining from that? which is why I actually created workshops that I talk five, 10 minutes and then I give you activities to do because I want people to go away and action it. Yeah. But what I was questioning was why am I seeing these really cool people do really cool things, but they're not getting on these panels. And I sort of, I feel like, of course we can blame event organizers and say, you know, you're not diversifying your panels. You're not working hard enough. But I also think that probably the cool people I was seeing also weren't recognizing or doing enough self-promotion to get themselves in those rooms or to get themselves seen by those people. Yeah. So rather than waiting, you know, um, 10 years before I became a CEO or an MD to get invited, maybe even to get invited on those panels, I said I was going to set up Foot Being Humble, which would 
I would create my own stage where I would give a workshop and I would then invite people that I think deserve to be spotlighted and celebrated. And almost all the people in that I interviewed have all been on my panels and have all shared, in fact, all of them have, have all shared amazing advice to my community and ones that I wish I'd like filmed the events and recorded because they would have made great podcasts. And so when it came to writing the book, I'm very aware of the fact that I am a white woman and I didn't just want it to be my version of advice because Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to hear different people from different religions, ethnicities, what different class you are, you know, whether you've had a really working class background, you've had to hustle really hard and get where you are. You know, I I really wanted to shine a light on a variety of people. And and I'm a strong believer that more, more heads are better than one in Mm. terms of like gathering information. Whenever I work on a brief, I always ask everybody their opinions before I give my answer. And I think the same went for the book. I, I wanted people to feel that they were being spoken to by a range of different people that, are incredibly talented Mm. and I didn't want it to just be my voice and and I think it comes down to the heart of for being humble it's like it's all about celebrating and promoting other people or promoting people so it had to contain those it had to shine a light on those people and you also speak in the book about the importance of having mentors yes what for you what is a mentor what makes a good mentor and how do you How do you find one? So I always laugh when I get this question because I've actually never explicitly had a mentor that has known about it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think I've had lots of mentors, but they come in the shape of my dad or my old manager or a close friend of mine or a flatmate and or my boyfriend. You know, there are people that, mentor you throughout your life that you probably don't even realize you probably don't thank enough so a big thank you to all of those people that have but I think we get this idea of finding a mentor people make out to be really really hard it's not Mm. it's super easy whoever it is in your industry that you admire write down a list of about 10 to 20 people that you'd love to mentor you and what's really important in that list is it's not just the CEOs or the award-winning top of the league people that it is the people that are mid-level and also the people that are similar ages to you and you know speaking to people to people that are full-time employed people that are entrepreneurs people that are podcast hosts but you know they're in your industry or, or maybe sometimes they're outside of your industry like having a variety of mentors I think is actually a really clever way for people to get varied responses you're going to go to one person you're only getting one person's perspective based on their values, based on their lived experiences. So it was actually, and I can't claim this advice as my own, um, Olivia Crook, who is, uh, who works at Spotify. She was on one of my panels and she said, she's a black female creative. She said that she has a white senior uh, man mentor who teaches her how to make money because they're very good at doing that. She has a black female um creative mentor within her industry and then she has another mentor external to her industry and so that allows her to get information from lots of different people and use it at different stages and i really love that advice that she gave and i include that in the book actually because i think it's so useful for people to hear that it you know it's it is that it isn't that hard so during lockdown a friend of mine contacted five different mentors that he said, I'd love you to be my mentor in the first instance. I'd just love you to look at my portfolio. Yeah. Four of them came back and said yes. And I think that's a time, telling of this time, that we're in a giving headspace. Mm. People want to support, people want to give back. And ultimately, mentors, being a mentor is, is flattery. Um, I unfortunately, I, I don't mentor, but that's because my role is so inherently based on mentoring and advising that I yeah. don't think I'd have a minute of the day for that. And I am the only person running Foot Being Humble yeah. by myself. But I, I think it's, you know, it's as simple as identifying people on LinkedIn that you want to connect with, sending them a message, explaining a bit about you, but also really explaining why you want 
them in particular like I read the article you wrote on this and it changed my perspective on my life forever and I'm so grateful and I'd love to speak to you about some of the writing that I've got coming up or you know just just making that human connection at the very beginning because when you just copy and paste a message it's very obvious mm. and it isn't going to get you far so and I also think be very specific with what you're asking their help on so I'd love to set up a 30 minute phone call once a month where we talk about some of the struggles I'm having in these areas um, we can do that in person or remotely um, or if a better time would suit let me know you know just like be, ask what you want but also be open to working around their schedule because they're about to offer your their time for free uh, and just be really clear with it and, and say you know I'd love to just quickly jump on a phone call for 10 minutes just to chat to you if, if you've got time and create that action of like them say okay let's have a quick chat and let them decide whether they they can offer that time to you mm, brilliant I, I love how there's, there's so much in in the book and what you're saying and how you're a, approaching people here that it's always it's always about them there's always this kind of like um you know what can i what can i do for you how can i have you involved yeah how massively can I, how can i create this community and there's that there's a way of being that comes like you said there's a way that a way that of being that kind of generates that um in your in your communication and it's a, it's a very it's a subtle but very distinct way of of creating relationships that's um that's very powerful and goes goes beyond what we might narrowly think of as self-promotion and actually makes it more about you know kind of community building and involvement there's i i listened to an amazing ted talk um about the fact the how you progress in your career it's by carla harris and it says it's how to how to find the person that can help you get far in the workplace mm. and she talks about the fact that there are two ways that you're going to progress there's performance currency and there is relationship currency and performance currency is often what we focus the most on so that is making sure that you deliver something really well and going above and beyond and letting people see that so that's one way that you could do well but relation cur relationship currency is based on the relationships you build with people and whether they will put their status, their role at risk or put themselves out to help you progress mm. is based on how much you input and how much you invest in other people. And it's honestly one of those things that I watched that talk and I was like, that really like hits home for me because I feel like throughout my career, I've always really tried to invest both in my performance, but also relationships because I, I love people I love working with people I love creating things I love being collaborative mm. and actually though when I invest in relationships people get a lot from me I, I give give my all yeah. and I actually think in some cases it's the relationships that I've invested in that have helped massively helped progress aspects of my career or opportunities within it because I saw the power in that. And, and then watching that TED talk, I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. That, that's definitely something I feel like I've done before, but I've never seen it presented in that way. And, and for some people it's, it's a given and it's natural, but for a lot of people it's not. And I think we really forget how important it is to mm. show that respect and care and attention for the people around you and in order to get that back, basically. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I, uh, I know that you're a, you're a, a, a music lover <laughs> and you often yeah. speak about um, musicians and some of the you know, successful musicians like, uh, like Stormzy and, um, and how they've been unabashed about their self-promotion. Can you give us some insights on that, on the kind of inspiration that you've gleaned and the insights that you've gleaned from, from other creatives? Yeah, so I think on the music thing, so for context, so I, when I was my, writing my proposal for Foot Being Humble, I was in the Ace Hotel in East London and I was in the, in the lobby area, like when all the one, creators do. One in Shoreditch. One of those, I'm oh, sorry. I know, I know, I've been Everyone there. Everyone knows laptop. that one. <laughs> and I was, I was listening to, I love 90s and noughties R&B and hip hop and I was listening to these songs and I was like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if you could like interject 
some of the lyrics and some of the words from these into a brand because that would make professional development so less stuffy and boring. So I name my events like Let Me Blow Your Mind, which is the song by even Gwen <laughs> Stefani or Rihanna, Bitch Better Have My Money is the workshop and people absolutely love it. So I think on a relationship <laughs> build, like, oh, even the lyrics have inspired genius. me. Genius. Um, but genius. I think it, 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 that comes out as well. It's like for me, when I set out to create the content with Foot Being Humble, it always had to challenge what was currently out there. Yeah. And just creating an event that was called like, boost your profile in 10 days like it's not it's not me and it's not what I wanted the brand to be but I think so I read Stormzy's or I listened sorry to Stormzy's audible book um book sorry on audible uh, rise up yeah. and it was brilliant and I absolutely love how they pieced it together he actually had lots of people contribute and they all narrated each of their sections which I thought was beautiful and one of the things that he he'd said that I, I really encourage people to think about is when people say no ask why and in some cases it may feel like you're being a bit persistent a bit pushy but a really great example he gives in the book is when he wants to perform at the festival he wants a stage that goes right down into the middle of the audience and mm. they say no and he's like well i want it i like why what is the problem and they're just like we just don't do it we're not doing it and there was so much pushback and he says I just kept on asking them why why not is there any way we could do it and open opening the narrative around that it's it definitely works with rejection as well as like asking why things haven't happened or why they can't often it's because the other people don't know how to do it or they're scared of doing it doesn't yeah. mean that it's a no altogether so one of the things I love about Stormzy and he talks about as well getting the basics right um it's like first of all just like making sure you show up on time making sure that you're a nice person making sure like everything's up to date and that you're just a genuinely decent human being like they're things that will help you advance but his like inquisitive nature of asking why isn't doesn't ever come across as forceful or pushy mm. it's just ambition yeah it's, it's him demonstrating that he wants to do this so much and he doesn't want to take no for an answer. So he keeps asking and finding ways to do it. And I think that's something that we can all learn from. I also in the book talk about different people. So um, I talk about Adele. I love Adele and, uh, and maybe that's the millennial Brit in me, but <laughs> she, she's so unapologetic about everything. Yeah. She's unapologetic about being a hackney, cockney, you know, swearing all the time. She's unapologetic about her songs and and who she is and I think what I love about her is it what you see on screen is what I, I assume because I've never met Adele but I assume what you see off screen as well like she's just so relatable and honest and she I love her she actually once drunk tweeted so many times she got like banned from her own Twitter page <laughs> and and that is like so honest and relatable and that story like didn't go against her it went for her and and one of the things that I say to a lot of people, particularly anyone listening right now who's applying for jobs and um, putting themselves through applications is just be your like honest and authentic self. And I don't mean authentic as a buzzword. I mean it as like the Adele version where it's like, be the person that you are around your friends and your peers and try not to be too professional. It's really upsetting when I see CVs, portfolios, or even interview people that let trying to be too professional overtake their actual personality. Yeah. And I, I know from first-hand experience because I did that. So in an interview, I, um, I'm so polished in interview because I've moved jobs quite regularly and, mm. you know, I pitch and sell for a living. I, I don't get hugely scared of them when I'm applying for jobs I'm, because I've got the answers ready and I know and I got a job and then when I started the job I said oh I don't really eat, I don't really eat vegetables I don't really like them and they were like what and they started laughing at me and they were like are you being serious I was like yeah and I also get all my sayings mixed up like I once said a bull in a Chinese shop and <laughs> I have said like double-ended sword and things like that like I, I just I say silly things all the time and I trip up all the time and they like burst out laughing they were like and they were really smiling and I was like what's the look and they were like I, was like I hope I've not just tainted my view of you of me and they were like do you know what it's actually just really nice to hear a, a non-polished version and like a, 
a bit more of a relatable version mm -hmm. of you. And that has really stuck out to me of as easy and as, as easy as it can be to fall into buzzwords and giving this like really um, presentable version of yourself. Just remember to show sides of your personality, sides to your personality, because when it comes to assessing you, if you have the exact same professional skills as someone else, the next thing they're going to look at is your personality. They're going to then choose you based on whether you're funny to work with, whether you're, you've got a really great energy, whether you can laugh at yourself, but still come up with great ideas. Like they're the soft skills that people will start to judge you on. Yeah. So I, I do feel like, you know, taking a bit of Adele um, attitude is, is really useful and really helpful. There are a list of other celebrities that I reference in the book that I think we can learn from. But I think as musicians, I, I, like I love Adele's like zero fucks given basically <laughs> and uh, Stormzy's constant questioning of how can we do this not why can't we absolutely love it I love it I think that's probably a good place for us to conclude I've got I've got more questions for you I've you know I've what you've spoken about so far is absolute gold so I really oh, thank, you. thank you for sharing your expertise and your passion and your enthusiasm and your your graciousness and your gratitude because I think that's one of the things that's really stuck with me is um how how you've you know the everything that you've been doing has been about there's been an element of understanding other people first and seeing where they're at and being yeah. able to communicate into that and build and build a, a tribe, build a community and make connections. Um, and that's a very different, a different way of seeing self-promotion. Thank you. That's, um, that's, I really appreciate hearing those words. And I think it can be hard to know the impact that you're having when you're in it and particularly when you mm. work by yourself. So like, I am always so grateful of people who give, as we talked about the testimonials or just drop me a DM on Instagram that say like, this has helped in this way because that's the whole reason we're doing, we do what we do, isn't it? To know that we're having an impact. And I think it's, it's been such an amazing journey over the past two years. Mm. And I've been so, I have been really grateful of everything that's come my way. And I'm just really excited for the future and sort of what, what's, what's going to come next really. Brilliant. So thank you so much for having me. It's been really nice to talk to you. My pleasure. And if they, and if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? So you can drop me an email at steph at fuckbeinghumble.com. Annoyingly, it can get blocked, the email. So just add <laughs> me as a contact. Um, didn't think about that when I built my brand. Um, and follow us at fbeinghumbleldn on Instagram and Twitter. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn. So I usually post all of my workshops and just regular weekly tips on self-promotion on the Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn page. So awesome. definitely check those. And you can also register to our newsletter that I do once a month, which is packed with tips on how to self-promote well. Brilliant. Love it. I shall put those details in the information of this podcast. And Steph, once again, thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.